Now the schedule of today, now notice I have philosophy of religion. The schedule today called for philosophy of religion and philosophy of science. Well, if you did all that reading, you're just a little bit ahead. Because as I worked on it, I realized these two areas, I mean, you know, epistemology and metaphysics are, are my big deals, but they're like foundational to everything else. You know, what, what is the nature of reality in metaphysics? What, how do we know in epistemology? But in terms of practical applicability, uh, philosophy of religion and philosophy of science are the two most important in the world today. Because philosophy of science is the, is the, the primary sort of addicted philosophy of, of Western culture today. Philosophy of science drives so much of what people believe is true. And philosophy of religion is the right way to respond to that. And so I decided as I worked on it, there's enough content, we're going to focus entirely on philosophy of religion today. Next week, we will do philosophy of science, and then in the second half, I'll probably do uh, human nature and philosophy of politics, which are, they're all important, but they're not as critical, I think, for our <coughs> So today, we're going to focus entirely on philosophy of religion. Next week, I plan, hope, intend, pray, that I will have for you the notes on what you need to know for this class. Much of that, as I've said before, and as you've already been able to tell if you've been reading the book, much of that has to do with, with terms. You know, if you understand the definitions of things, then the concepts come fairly, fairly directly after that. So it's the definitions. I, and I want to say one other thing, and I was, um, I say this cautiously. I think the book, I know it's difficult if you've never had philosophy, or even if you have had philosophy, because it's an entirely new language. Like anything else, it takes work when the first time you start. If you try to learn Spanish, then you've got an idea what it's like to learn a whole new language. Well, philosophy is no different than that. And that's why in this course, I'm lecturing from the book. I am, my lectures are walking us through the book in order to help people understand things they're struggling with as they read it. A couple of people have expressed to me trauma over trying to read this stuff. <laughs> And, I, and don't, don't take this lightly, but if you are really deeply troubled by trying to read this material, then don't read the material. Now, I'm not encouraging you not to read the book. I want you to. But if you really are, are you know, beating yourself up or staying awake at night or feeling traumatized by this stuff, I'm going to cover the same thing in the lectures. So just come to the lectures and maybe go back and read the book after you come to the lectures. But don't let this be a trauma to you, okay? That doesn't help. Um, so, I give you permission, if that's your situation. It doesn't mean you're off the hook. <laughs> All right? So, next week, philosophy of science, human nature, philosophy of politics, and then ethics, the question, what is right? And then aesthetics, what is beauty, or what is beautiful? And then the conclusion, final exam. As always, we start with what is philosophy, It literally, Phileo and sophos are the Greek words for love and wisdom. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. It's a, a way to critically examine our foundational beliefs about the nature of reality, of knowledge and truth, and our moral and social values. The definition that I think I like best, philosophy at the bottom here, philosophy is the attempt to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. Alvin Plantinga, one of the great philosophers alive today, who also happens to love Jesus, a great reformed theologian as well as philosopher. And you can tell he's great because how often he gets quoted in this book, you know. Uh, Al Plantinga has said that philosophy is thinking hard about something. Because philosophy touches everything. There's a philosophy of everything because philosophy means, you know, what are the larger issues behind whatever, you have a philosophy of art, you have a philosophy of medicine, you have a philosophy of science, a philosophy of everything. And as I said before, there's a reason why the highest or terminal degree, as they call it, in, in almost any discipline, there are a couple of exceptions to that, is a doctor of philosophy in whatever it is, okay? Uh, because it is the, the overarching umbrella analysis of everything else that you can study and understand in your life, okay? No less than that. Which is why I think this is important, even though it's hard, and I know it's hard. You know, even I, reading, going back and reading the book, I'm thinking, okay, now back up, Ross, think about that again. And I've been through this stuff a lot, okay? Today, we want to talk about philosophy of religion. The question, does God exist? And if he does exist, what can we know about it? All right? 
The question of the existence or non-existence of God, as it may seem obvious to you, affects everything else. Now, it may seem obvious to you, there are other non-Christian or non-theistic people who would say that this isn't relevant at all. Because they believe that philosophy of science, philosophy of uh, aesthetics, philosophy of something else is important, but God doesn't exist anyway, so why do we worry about it? But in fact, if God exists, there are reasons, purposes, meaning, and <coughs> attached to human existence and all of, the, all of the events of human existence. If God does not exist, contrary, everything is random, nothing has ultimate meaning or significance, there's not reason to hope for anything better. And if that's true, then don't, you don't have to work hard at anything, because it doesn't really ultimately matter anyway. Okay? Humanity being what it is, even in, in a lack of belief in God, we come up with reasons to justify our efforts. But in the absence of God, if you're honest with it, at the end of the day, it boils down to nothing really matters. But believing in God, at least believing in the Christian God, does have its downside in that it does mean there is accountability. One of the, at least honest, skeptics who's quoted in the book says, I don't want there to be a God. Because if there is, then that puts, you know, that gives me responsibilities. There's an onus on me. I'm held accountable. At least he's honest about that. Because it does. But again, the choice, when we talk about the existence of God, the choice is believing in God and, and therefore believing there is both meaning and hope. Or not believing in God and wondering, why the hell does it matter? Ultimately, that's why philosophy of religion, does God exist, is so critical. So, does God exist? It's important to recognize that prior to the 19th century, virtually every thinking person was convinced that God's existence could, could be not only argued, but proven. This was assumed. Most philosophers, prior to, again, the mid-19th century, which is mid-1800s, they were advocates of natural theology, which is very scriptural, which says that the belief in God could be known by human reason and experience. Scripture says that the, truth, the reality of God is shown in the glory of His handiwork, the experience that we have, and the reasonable arguments, the logical, cognitive kinds of understanding that will lead us to believe in the Supreme Being. We're going to look at some of that today. Today, very few people seem to even know that those arguments exist. And people who know they exist assume, and our book does a good job talking about this, assume that all of that's been disproven, that all of those arguments, ontological, teleological, cosmological arguments, have all been dispelled and dispensed with, which is not true. There have been arguments against them, but there have subsequently been counter-arguments against that. People like Alvin Plantinga and others, who, are, who very much believe that there are still very strong, logical, reasonable, rational, philosophical arguments for the existence of God. We're going to talk a little bit later about, well, do we even have to have those? Okay. Uh, what I want us to do now is to talk about just a few of the most important of those arguments. Now, the arguments for the existence of God, a couple of them actually claim that they, particularly the ones that are more abstract, that they can, from an abstract logical point of view, prove the necessity, the necessary existence of God as a divine being. Uh, some of the others don't claim to prove it, but they are significant in that they give us very compelling reason to believe it's true. You understand the difference there? A proof is something that you can say, it's settled. <laughs> a compelling argument for means it makes sense to believe it, although it's not absolutely, you know, the uh, deal. It's like the difference, in, in um, we've talked about this before, when you talk about reason, um, or doubt. When, when our legal system is not based upon somebody being convicted of a crime, if they are found to be guilty beyond any possible um, <coughs> alternative, any possible reason, we don't require that in anything in human. You know, to be absolutely proven is never required. What we, we, can, we can convict people and even execute them based upon proof beyond any reasonable doubt. So the point I'm making is that some of the, like the cosmological, the ontological argument we'll talk about first, claims logically to prove that God exists. Most of the arguments simply give compelling evidence so that it is 
evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, to use the term that we're used to hearing on all the cop shows. Okay? Maybe the lawyer shows would be better. Let's start with the first one. It's not the oldest one, but we start with it because it is probably the most abstract. Now, as I get into these, discussing these arguments, I'm going to try to explain them a, a little more uh, lay language than maybe the book did. If you don't fully understand all of these things, that's okay. In fact, any one of these arguments, um, Thomas Aquinas had five proofs for God, he called them, five arguments for God. And one of the things is that people will pick one and then argue against it. And Aquinas was very quick to say, no, 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 don't pick one. You have to look at all five because various of them address various aspects. And so if you don't get everything about one of these arguments, if it doesn't quite click with you, don't panic. We'll get to one in a minute that will make more sense. But they are all valid. Okay. Let's talk about Anselm's ontological argument. This suggests that the very idea of God as a supreme being logically proves that he must really exist. Now, ontological, the word ontological, we talked about ontology before, it means being or existence or reality. Ontology is a subset of metaphysics, which means the examination of what does it mean to be, what does it mean to exist. So the ontological argument, which was first presented by Anselm of Canterbury, um, logically tries to demonstrate that God must exist. Okay? Now let's, the argument goes like this. And I'm going to, in each case, I'm going to walk you through the logical argument. And then we'll talk about, we'll come back and talk about it, okay? First, Anselm said, I can conceive of a greatest conceivable being. A being that is perfect, that, you know, is, is immutable, omnipotent, omnipresent, etc. My mind can conceive of that. Obviously, religions have been conceiving of that since before written history. And he referred to the greatest conceivable being, and that's usually abbreviated GCB. I can conceive, I can hold an idea in my mind of the greatest conceivable being. All right? You you're okay with that? Then he said, what is real and concrete, that is outside my mind, outside me, is greater by definition than what exists only in my mind. Okay, the idea of something that, the aspect of being a real thing is greater, more significant, more perfect than what's only in my mind. Right? You okay with that one? That the quality of real existence adds value is what we're saying, as opposed to just being an abstract thought in my mind. We're good. Not. Okay. <laughs> Third, if the greatest conceivable being exists only in my mind, because I can conceive of that, then it would not actually be the greatest conceivable being. Because I can conceive of the greatest conceivable being existing in reality, and not just in my mind. Got that? Yes. No. Okay. If the greatest conceivable being is only in my mind, then it's that's not as great as the greatest conceivable being existing really outside of me. And I can conceive of a greatest conceivable being existing outside of me. And that would be greater. So by definition, the greatest conceivable being that's outside my mind is more the greatest conceivable being than one that's only in my mind. Because existence and reality is a, an added value to only existing in my brain. Okay, got that? Therefore, the greatest conceivable being must exist in reality, or he would not be the greatest conceivable being. Pam? Um, so are you saying um, out, of, out of your mind is the same as reality? No. Well, yeah, I'm using those terms, I'm using that interchangeably. Yes. I mean, think about it. If I have in my mind this image of this great sports car, is that as valuable as having a real sports car that I can drive? Or is it not true that something that actually exists is inherently more real, more valuable than what's only in my mind? Well, if it's only in your mind and not outside, it's just an imagination. Well, not an imagination. There are real things. There are abstract things that exist in our mind. Think about numbers. Numbers are not imagination, but they only exist in our minds. 
Okay? Um, so, but the idea is, human beings, the very fact that we can conceive of the greatest possible being, the greatest conceivable being, in reality, would be greater than only being able to conceive of it in my mind. Therefore, the very fact that we can conceive of such a being means he must exist, or he would not be the greatest conceivable being. Okay? Don't panic. This is actually the hardest one that I'm starting with, because this is the one that is entirely abstract. Logically, this has existed for you know hundreds and hundreds of years, like almost a thousand years. And so, and, and there have been people who dispensed with it, who dismissed it, and I'm not going to get, some of that I'll get into on these arguments, but a lot of that's in the book. The, the, one, the aspect of it that people usually uh, disagree with is that uh, what is real and concrete outside my mind is greater than what exists in my mind. Immanuel Kant, because his whole thing was that reality was, was based upon how our minds structure things. Remember when we talked about Kant? That we have, you know, we have inside our minds categories like causality, you know, and that our minds organize what comes in through our senses and then reality is, is what our minds do. Obviously, therefore, Kant was not one who was willing to admit that what's outside of us is more real than what's in our brains, because he thought in our brains was what real reality was. But that's Kant. Not everybody has agreed with that. There have been differences. Um, some people believe that the argument has been made, and the book talks about there was a monk, Gamil, uh, not too well, he actually lived during the same time as Einstein. He said, well, I can, I can conceive of the greatest possible island. Does that mean it exists? Well, no. And Anselm and everybody since then has said, no, we're talking about a perfect being. That when we say the greatest conceivable being, being an island is not perfect. You know, the, I, I read another, another philosophy book recently, and it, it was kind of embarrassing how they tried to parody this by saying, you know, I can, I can conceive of the greatest possible cashew. And yet, then there's even a better cashew, and a better cashew, and a better cashew. That's not the same thing as thinking of a being that has characteristics like being all-powerful, being all-knowing, being all-present, being all, you know, those things that we can conceive of God as being. Islands and cashews and, and things like that don't have those characteristics. And so therefore, you cannot actually conceive of the greatest possible cashew. And yet, and for God, you can. We humans have the ability to conceive of a being. While we may not be able to define all those things, you know, to the infinite natures of it, we can conceive of it. Humanity has always conceived of it. Every culture that has ever existed has had some conception of the supernatural or the divine. And the ontological argument, the argument, argument from being or existence is if I can conceive of it in my mind as the greatest possible being, by definition, an even greater greatest possible being is going to exist in reality. And so therefore, the logical argument is he exists. Yes. Um. So there's a difference between conception and comprehending. I mean, are you saying? I don't understand your question. My question is, you can conceive of a superior being. Right. Can you comprehend that superior being? Define comprehend in that, in that case. I'm sorry? Define comprehend. We're talking a purely logical argument. It has nothing to do with experiential. This is entirely logic and ration reason. It's not experiential. Those come later. When I when I look at comprehend as compared to uh, conceive, I can conceive, but that's not complete. Comprehension would, to me, imply a complete understanding of what I've conceived. Okay, you're going, going, the difference you're going past two. that argument. That's not that's not that's not part of the ontological argument. And so let's stick with this. Comprehending and what, whether it means fully understanding or experiencing or whatever, those things are outside this logical argument. I got you. Okay. Got you. Now, the, those issues come into some of the other things. What? One more question. Well, okay. Excuse me. What is the date of Anselm? Um, more or less. 1100s, 1200s. 1033 and 11. I was thinking 11th century. I guess I was thinking 1100s. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So this is one argument, and it is one. Even though David Hume tried to argue against it. <laughs> And contrary to argue against it, they have not dismissed it. It is still a valid argument that is still being discussed. And particularly Christian theists get it, 
still argue the, the you know the premises of it because the way you the way you present an argument is through these are premises. Remember our logic discussion. The way you try to counter an argument is by finding one or more of the premises to be invalid. In other words, to find defeaters, as they're called, for those. People have attempted to do this, and again, the general the the the, the general thought amongst people is that oh, this has been completely dismissed, folks. It hasn't. It is still a valid logical argument. It is one of the hardest ones, and so if you don't fully get it, that's okay. But it is only one of them. And it is the most abstract one because it's the one that relies entirely upon um, logic and rational conception. Okay? So let's move on and talk about some of the others. The second, and by the way, Anselm was not the only one who dealt with that. There were suggestions of it before him. He's the, in each case, what I'm giving you are the people that articulated it uh, most clearly or are most popular for it because they're the ones you'll read. So the second argument we want to look at is Aquinas' cosmological argument. Cosmology means uh, creation. You know, when you talk about the cosmology of the universe, it's how did it come to be? Okay, the exi how, did, how is it created? So this is the argument from causation that suggests that since every effect must have a cause, and there cannot logically be an infinite regression of causes, meaning this caused that, and this was caused by that, and this was caused by that, and that was caused by that, you know. And I'll discuss that in a minute. There must be a first cause, sometimes called a prime mover, who started, which started everything. You might say, who started everything? So, everything that exists came from something else. Well, what was the first thing? The first cause. The first mover. What's that? The chicken or the egg. Well, yeah, the chicken or the egg is sort of a, you know, what came first. So, but except we're talking about how far back. So the argument goes like this. First, there is an order of causes in the world. Meaning, things create other things. You know, everything that exists comes from something else. You know, where do babies come from? <laughs> um, where, where do, how do buildings happen? Well, something caused that to be there and in every case. Because nothing can be the cause of itself. Nothing can come from nothing. Everything has to come from something else. Scientifically, this relates to the conservation of energy and matter. Do you know that? We're talking physics now. The conservation of energy or matter says that neither energy or matter can be created or destroyed. It can only be reorganized. What that means is anything that exists had to come from something else, some other form, some other source. You know, when we drive an automobile, the power that drives that automobile, what does it come from? The burning of gasoline. Where does the gasoline come from? Oil. Where does the oil come from? The earth. How does it get in the earth? Animals die. Creating petroleum. Where do the animals come from? They were born from other animals. Where do those animals come from? They were born from other You see what I mean? Anything you can identify had some cause, something that came before it that caused it to exist, and nothing can have caused itself in our experience of the universe. Nothing can come from nothing. Therefore, everything that is caused must be caused by something else. Yet there cannot be an infinite regression of causes. If you if, if pick anything you want and follow the causes back, at some point it had to start somewhere. The reason for that is, uh, you know, people would argue, it used to be that people argued. Um, People who didn't believe in God argued that the universe has always existed. That was one of their beliefs. Well, that's been shot in the head by the Big Bang Theory, you know, like from an entirely secular perspective. Uh, they believe that the universe did have a beginning now. Uh, but the old view was that the universe had no beginning. The problem with that is that it creates an infinite number of events seconds, minutes, days, activity, well, something back in the, in the past. Now, the, the idea of infinite, for the mathematicians in the group, it is possible to think of something being an infinite set, an infinite group, abstractly, you know, to think of infinity in an abstract sense. But when you're talking about the seconds and hours and days and events that have happened in the real past, 
you know, before this moment, and yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, and last year, and a million years from now, before now, that is not an abstract. Those are concrete things. Those are things that really happen. The concept of an infinite number of concrete things is an absurdity. It can't be. Infinity only exists as an abstract. When you try to make it a concrete, it creates absurdities. And the book does a pretty good job of giving some examples of that. Like, if you had a library with an infinite number of books in it, which are real concrete things, and somebody came and took half of them away, how many books would be left in your library? An infinite number. So how can, you, how can infinity be a concrete thing when you run into absurdities like half of infinity is infinity? You see what I mean? So the idea, abstractly, we can conceive of infinities. In a concrete sense, which has, which has to be what we're talking about, if we're talking about real days that led up till now, it cannot be. There are absurdities that prevent us from believing there is a, an infinite number of concrete moments or events leading up to now. It had to start somewhere, or it couldn't exist. You got that? Is that fair? Yes. This is what I was talking about with Randy, and I just decided to leave it alone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Her brother's a mathematician, and so we, I started to get into this, and then he was talking about abstract numbers and negative numbers, and you know, and and things, and those aren't those are abstracts. I mean, um, a negative number is an abstract. You can't really have a negative anything. Okay. Um, therefore, based on these things, that there's an order of causes that in the world that we can see and experience, every, and that nothing can be the cause of itself. Everything has a prior cause. Everything is caused must be caused by something else. There cannot be an infinite regression of causes because that leads us to logical absurdities. Therefore, there must be a first uncaused cause or prime mover. The first one that started everything. And that, by definition, is God. Got that? Yes. This one's a little easier than the ontological argument. I think the only problem here is understanding why you can't have an infinite regression of concrete things. Okay? Part of the benefit, even if you don't get the specifics of these, is for you to experience the fact that there are some very valid, logical, reasonable arguments for the existence of God. It's not just what you feel about it. Just knowing that, whether you know the actual arguments or not, is valuable. Although knowing the actual arguments is helpful. All right, let's go to the third one, which is the teleological argument that Paley popularized, although, again, it's existed for a long time. This is probably the most common sense one. Um, from for lay people. It's called the argument from design or sometimes the watchmaker argument and it says that the complexity of the world demands belief in a creator in the same way that the complexity of a watch demands belief in a watchmaker. And Paley actually said, because he was, you know, he was from Great Britain, he said if you're walking across the moors and you come across a watch, a working watch, is it reasonable to suppose that just happened by accident? Or would you not have to reasonably assume that there was a watchmaker responsible for making that? So, the argument goes like this. A watch has many complex parts, works, a sp uh, um, works to perform a specific and intentional function, and is intelligently designed to achieve that function. Okay? Who's going to look at a watch and think that happened by accident? Right? <laughs> It's there for a reason, it's complex, somebody had to have done that on purpose. Similarly, and this is, this is an argument by analogy, meaning relationship between things. Similarly, the world has many complex parts, works, is, works for a, toward a specific and intentional function, sorry for the typos there, especially the function of sustaining life, okay. and is intelligently designed to achieve that function, we would argue. Therefore, there is a very high probability, you'll notice not proof, a very high probability that the world, like the watch, was intelligently designed by a creator. Now, you see a watch and you think, boy, that's awfully complex with you know, gears and wheels and cogs and crystals and the whole thing. A watch is nothing compared to the complexity that exists in systems in the world. And if you don't realize that, you're not paying attention. Okay? Um, and this... Somewhat the teleological argument, and this gets into a little bit the next one, the fine-tuning, which is a version of the teleological argument. 
A lot of work has been done by scientists in recent years um, on the theme of irreducible complexity. Are you familiar with that? When we talk about design, there are a, a great many things that exist in the world that are so complex, if you removed any one aspect of them, the whole thing wouldn't work anymore. Now, to understand, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, sidestep here and understand that evolution, the argument from evolution by natural selection, Darwinian evolution, says that every characteristic that exists in living creatures exists only because that characteristic aided them in survival and therefore was retained rather than rejected. Okay? In other words, everything, and, and that it's a result of minute changes. You know, you got a little bit of a benefit, and so the animal that had that small benefit survived and the others didn't. And then another slight benefit, and the, 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 you know, the, the litter mate that got, had that advantage survived and the others didn't. Well, there are some things that exist in, in the biological world for which you cannot break it down into what the steps were. A perfect example, the human eye. The complexity of the human eye. To have an iris that opens based upon light sensitivity, to have rods and cones in your retina that receive the variations in light intensity and, and, and translate that into color, communicate it through an optic nerve for the brain to interpret so that we see. There's no piece of that. You, you can't say, okay, the biologists, okay, the, the, the Darwinian evolutionists, I should say, they say that the human eye started as a light-sensitive freckle. What are the steps between a light-sensitive freckle and the human eye that would be of any advantage at all that it will allow, allow a creature to survive and therefore continue to develop advantages? It doesn't work. Um, Michael Behe is a, is a uh, biologist who has examined a number of, of, he's written several books on this, but Darwin's Black Box is one of the most popular ones. And one of the things he looked at were the tiny microscopic flagella. The flagella are these little protozoa looking things, and they have a, a whip, a tail, and they propel themselves by spinning that tail, okay, through liquids. Well, when, when B, he started examining this, this tail, this flagellum, I mean, they're called flagellum, but that thing is called a, you know, a flagella, I think. Um, that little tiny microscopic tail that is used to propel them through, through liquids is exactly the model that a modern motor has. It has all of the same pieces in it that allows this thing to turn, to drive it forward, that a motor has. And Behe makes the argument of irreducible complexity. There's no piece of that. You can't reduce that by one part and have it work. It had to go from nothing to working. There's no steps in between that would make any sense from an evolutionary point of view. That's true for a lot of things. The idea of irreducible complexity, you cannot reduce by any small part the complexity of many of the biological features in the world and have them work. Well, that's part of the argument from design. You can't take the design of the physical, especially the biological world, and back it up to the point where it started as nothing more than amino acids in a, you know, in a primordial pool. You can't get back there. And if you did, you couldn't get back here. Does that make sense? So you understand that design issue. And you will, if you, if you get into this at all, you will read about irreducible complexity as being one of the primary arguments that is sort of an advanced topic of the teleological design argument. All right, good with that? The, a version of the teleological, I'm, I'm now going to give you two of the arguments that are most, most modern. These are all quite old, all right? And they're still around. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There's, people have argued against them, but those arguments have not been conclusive. And some of them just simply don't make sense. I told Carolyn last night I was reading this book called 50 Philosophical Ideas, and I was reading some of these things. And it, again, this, you know, I can conceive of a perfect cashew, but then a cashew that's plumper than that would be even more perfect. And I'm going, are you an idiot or what? You can't see the difference of conceiving of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being versus a cashew? You know, there is a, there is a logical difference there. 
Okay. Well, one would have a strict definition, and the other would not. Well, yeah. that's, that's true. They both have, defi have definitions, but one of them, yeah. by definition, is beyond our, you know, right. it's, it's at the level of perfection, the greatest conceivable being. There's no greatest conceivable cashew or island or anything else. Okay. This is a version of the teleolo teleological argument, which is quite modern, quite new, and it's based upon modern scientific research. Um, the scientific discoveries uh, in recent years have been, there you go, have been, uh, a lot of it has, has discovered cosmic constants. These are numerical values that exist in the universe. Things like the force of gravity, which is, can be expressed in a numerical value. Electromagnetic attraction, dark matter. Some of this gets into some of the um, advanced quantum mechanics kind of stuff. But as we've learned more and more and more about the universe, we've learned that there are constants that exist. For instance, I'll give you a couple of them. The rate of expansion of the universe. The universe expanded. Now, like, we're assuming the Big Bang for a minute. Okay, let's, let's give them that. <laughs> All right, and I'm not, and I believe the Big Bang might be real, but the question is, where? I've said before, you know, somebody says, well, I believe the universe started because an infinitely dense particle of matter exploded, and when it exploded, it expanded outward, and the universe was created in its wake. Well, where did that infinitely dense particle of matter come from? And after a pregnant pause, the best you'll get is, well, you see, there was this infinitely dense particle of matter, and if they say, well, it always had existed you get back to this issue of, really, there's an infinite regression of concrete moments in which that existed? That's, that's absurd. It's illogical. It's not rational. So anyway, when the universe, let's, let's give the Big Bang for a minute, and big, God may have used the Big Bang. I believe God may have created that infinitely dense particle of material, and that's how he did it. Okay? I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I believe the rest of the story can fold in that there. When, the, when the, the infinitely dense particle of matter in the Big Bang exploded and exploded outward, if that rate of expansion from that explosion had differed as little as 1 in 10 to the 60th power. Now that means, in case you don't know what that means, that means a 10 with 60 zeros after it. We don't have a name for a number that big. This is not a bazillion. This is bigger than a bazillion <laughs> trillion. From a, from, a, uh, from a statistical point of view, one writer has said that uh, one, one statistical physician, uh, physis physicist, oh, I'll get this out in a minute, has said those are the odds of standing at one end of the universe and shooting a gun at a target at the other end of the universe and hitting the bullseye. That's the likelihood. And yet, if it had varied even 1 in 10 to the 60th power in terms of the rate of expansion, then it would either have been expanding too slow and would have collapsed back in on itself, or it expanded too fast to allow the stars to form. And so no life could have existed. Now, this is not a theologian that came up with that. It's scientists. Again, the strong nuclear force. This is the force that binds protons and neutrons together. If it had been even 5% stronger or weaker, then the atomic structure that is necessary for human life to exist would not have existed. 5% difference. In fact, one of the other variations I read on this is that a proton is 1.001 the weight of a neutron. And if it varied by even 1 1,000th, we would have a problem because the proton would be inclined to turn into neutrons if it was stronger, or if it was lesser, it would go the other way. The, the uh, neutrons would turn into protons. So exact. You see what this is called the fine tuning argument? And it's not Christians, or at least not you know, Christian theologians, that have come up with this stuff. This has come out of science. The force of gravity. If the force of gravity had been stronger or weaker by even one to the 10th, uh, 1 in 10 to the 40th power. That's 10 with 40 zeros after it. Two thirds as much as the, the rate of expansion of the universe. If gravity had been stronger or weaker than stars, which could have supported life like our sun, would not have been formed. And there are a lot more of these things. So the issue comes up 
if the margins that are necessary for life to exist, for the world to be as it is, are this fine, almost infinitely fine, and just the tiniest, literally, the tiniest imaginable change in one direction or the other would have made this impossible for the world to exist and for human life or any kind of life to exist on it, doesn't it sound like somebody was paying attention when it all started? Mm -hmm. Is that not reasonable? Yes. So again, this is an argument from design, but it's based upon modern science, and they refer to this as the fine-tuning argument. And there's more than that. And the arguments that the, the people have made against it, like one of the popular arguments is, well, this is only one possible world, that there are an infinite number of worlds, perhaps in other dimensions, you know, this multi-dimensional kind of idea, and that for some of them, the universe did collapse. For some of them, the universe expanded too fast for stars. For some of them, gravity was too weak or too strong or whatever. Those are those other. We just happened to be on the one that it all worked. Really? You know, they, they say things like, we won the lottery. Okay. If every person in the world bought a lottery ticket, including me, and I won, the odds of me winning would be one in seven billion. That's me winning over everybody else on the planet. That isn't a fraction of the kinds of odds that we're dealing with when we talk about 10 to the 40th power, 10 to the 60th power. I mean, that would be like winning everybody on the planet, buying a lottery ticket every day for a year, and me winning 365 times. That's the kind of odds we're talking about. I mean, I just made that up. I'm not giving you that as statistical reality, but it's close to being the case. So the idea of saying, well, this is just a lottery, we won the lottery, besides which, there is no evidence other than just creative thinking that comes up with the multidimensional idea. You know, that there are multidimensions and multiple worlds. That's just somebody's idea. There's, it's not like they found another one. And maybe God has created other worlds and other dimensions. But you can't use that, which is simply something somebody came up with one day, with no evidence, to argue against these kinds of statistics. Right? It doesn't make sense not to believe that somebody was involved in making sure this all worked out right. Okay? Now, we're good with that one. Yes, sir. The Kalem cosmological argument, which is again a modern argument. Well, it's a modern version of an argument. Kalem, it's actually from an ancient, a more ancient Islamic argument. You know, at one point the the Islamic world had all the great scientists and philosophers. Had it not been for them, we would not have zero in our number system. There's a reason why we use Arabic numbers. Because the Muslim world were the smart ones for a long time. And then Christianity, actually by its nature, was more encouraging in the long term towards scientific investigation and, and whatnot, and that's why Western predominantly Christian world took over. Right? But this goes back to a fairly old Muslim argument that has been rediscovered and re-articulated more modernly. It seems like a, a, a simplified version of the cosmological argument, okay, which is... Um, because it's got fewer steps and everything else. But again, the cosmological argument, you will remember when we talked about um, the Aquinas' cosmological argument, that it has to do with argument from the prime mover, the first cause. All right. It begins with the first premise, the universe had a beginning. To say that the universe had no beginning would require an infinite number of past concrete events, which creates illogical absurdities, and so it's not possible. We just discussed that. Science, in addition to that, science now confirms the universe had a beginning. Assuming that that Big Bang was a beginning, without being able to explain where that particle came from that exploded. Science now does no longer claims, as they once did, that the universe has always existed. They recognize, by evidence and by logic, that can't be. So the universe had a beginning, first point, first premise. Second premise, the beginning of the universe was caused. Back to the cosmological argument, something cannot come from nothing. Eggs have to come from chickens. Chickens have to come from eggs that come from chickens. But at some point, you know, there has to be a cause. 
Whatever exists must have some cause for its existence. Two basic premises. Third premise, the cause of the beginning of the universe was God. Now, this is where it gets a little more complicated. By definition, in the Kalem cosmological argument, the cause of the universe, don't think God for a minute, but think about what kind of being, or you know, whatever you want to call it, space ghost, I don't care, what kind of entity would have been necessary to have created the universe? That's the first move of prime cause. <clears throat> Firstly, that entity would have to be transcendent, which means it would have to be outside time and space if he created time and space. Because you can't create time and space if you're in it. You know, time and space was created, it, ex it exists as part of the universe. It had to be created. Well, it couldn't exist before the being that created it created it. Make sense? Yes. Secondly, that, that entity would have to be immutable, which means not subject to change. Because if they're not in time and space, all change happens in time and in space. In the absence of being of being limited by time and space, which we said he was, God wasn't by transcendence, then God's not subject to change. That being would have to be immaterial, because to be unchangeable, immutable, which we just argued, means you can't be material. If you're a material being, then you are inherently subject to change. That being would have to be uncaused, because otherwise it would not be the first cause, which we just said there is a first cause of prime mover. That being would have to be powerful, duh, to create everything that is from nothing, ex nihilo, because we're talking about the creation of the universe, all that is known. That being would have to be personal, which means volitional, because that being would have to have made a decision to create the universe. There would be decisions to be made, which means having a mind, which means being a personal being. That being would have to be good and moral, because he chose to design a world where beings could exist, and where, and this is one of the other arguments for God, by the way, where there is an inherent sense of good and evil, of right and wrong, good and bad. C.S. Lewis makes that argument very, very completely, I think, in Mere Christianity. He says, when somebody says, well, that's just wrong, you know, where do you get the idea of right and wrong? Where does that come from? Well, my parents taught me what was right and wrong. Really? Aren't there things that you believe are right and wrong that are bigger than what your parents taught you? Where do we get that? In fact, some of the things we think are right and wrong are contrary to all experience. When a young mother of two children dies in an automobile accident, we just we say, that's wrong. That just simply shouldn't happen. Folks, that happens every day. Where do we get the idea that there's something that's not natural about that when it happens so commonly? Isn't there something inherent in us that says that there is a moral issue there, that some things are right and wrong? Some things are grievous and others are joyous? So the being would have to be good and moral. So if you have a being that is transcendent, and, and which logically, by the nature of the Kalem argument, would have to be, a being that is transcendent, immutable, immaterial, uncaused, powerful, personal, which means volitional, making choices, and good or moral, can somebody give me a good definition for God? <laughs> Sounds like God. The Kalem called cosmological argument. It actually simplifies it in some ways, but then when you get to the point of saying, of making the argument there's a prime mover, it takes the next step of saying, well, what would such a prime mover have to be like based upon the very nature of them being the creator of the known universe? Transcendent, immutable, immaterial, uncaused, powerful, personal, volitional, good moral. Okay? Now, yes? Is the same spot? Jehovah, or is another God? What's that? Is the same God, Jehovah, or is another God? Uh, well, we, uh, we're not differentiating. God, there's only one God. Yes, yes, I know. But and I don't think they, they believe God, it in what God, what is the name Well, God? the argument doesn't have to do with which God. It's just that there is a God, one true God. Whether Now, when this argument was first made, they would have called him Allah. You know, we don't. But that doesn't matter. I mean, that's a, that's a down the road. The argument for the existence is prior to any other names or descriptions or whatever. Okay. John? You have, you have a date for Caleb? Um, yeah. The book does. No, I didn't. Uh, the Caleb argument is in there. 
Uh, I don't. I'll see if I can find one for you if you can't find it. But well, well, uh, if you just got an idea, is he around? Is well, he no, no. Kalim is, is from a, a, an ancient Persian word, uh, which I think means cause. There isn't a date. There isn't a date. I'll find one for you. I don't have it right now. Okay? But it, it started back then, but then it's a very modern. So he's not, he's not contemporary. Well, it's not a he. Kalim is not a he. It's not a person. Uh, it's a, it's a, word, a Persian word, which I think means cause. Oh. Um, and so it started back in ancient Persia, you know, some because it's Islamic, it would have to have been after the 700s. But it's been reintroduced more, re mod more recently. For instance, a couple of modern Christian philosophers um, have, have focused on this and have done a lot of work with it, and I think it's very, very valuable. Okay? Now, I've just given you five, three older and two more modern versions of this. There are a lot more arguments for God. This is, you can go, Peter Kreeft is a Catholic evangelical, okay? Um, he's professor, he's retired now, theologian, philosopher, great writer, great speaker, very funny, you know, if you ever have a chance to hear him speak. Um, he's actually supposed to have been at the conference that I was at in England in July, and two days before the conference, one of his best friends passed away, so he couldn't come. Um, so we ended up with Eric um, Metaxas speaking twice, which was still pretty cool. Um, Peter Creek, you can go on a website, 20 Arguments for the Existence of God, do a search. And he, out, he gives you all of these. All right? Um, so there's a lot more rational, rational, logical arguments for the existence of God. Okay? We'll do one more thing before we take a break. But we have to ask the question, do we even need rational arguments for God's existence? I mean, it's kind of reassuring and, and even kind of fun to realize that you can, you can argue logically, rationally, reasonably, that God exists as well or better than anybody can argue that he doesn't exist. And later on, we're going to look at one of the very few you know, sort of proactive arguments for God not existing, which is the existence of evil. We'll talk about that. But do we need rational arguments? Many modern philosophers and scientists maintain a principle which is called evidentialism, which is part of classical foundationalism, which we talked about in a previous class. I'm not going to get into that again right now. Evidentialism is the view that no belief should be held unless one has sufficient evidence for it, which obviously brings you back to the question of what constitutes sufficient evidence. Now, the logical positivists, as a group, they were, they were evidentialists. They said you had to be able to prove it scientifically. That you had to have, a, you know, um, you had to be able to do an experiment to show it was true, or you couldn't believe in it. Obviously, that anything abstract, anything, you know, non-material, anything that's not in the physical world doesn't fit that. But evidentialism is quite common. Scientists, some philosophers, others will say, if you don't have any real proof for it, then how can you believe that? Well, first we need to recognize, as we've just seen, there is strong logical evidence for the existence of God. I mean, I could argue physical evidence as well, because like the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, talks about the physical nature of the flagellum and the eye and all that kind of stuff. But there is strong logical evidence, but still the question, which Alvin Plantinga is one of the people who dealt with this, is why should belief in God require evidence at all? Why can't belief in God be seen as properly basic? And the words properly basic are actually a technical term. I, I um, italicize them later. Why can't belief in God be seen as properly basic to our existence? Uh, John Calvin talked about the sense of the divine that all people seem to have. I've said before, sociologists have never yet found a human culture that did not have some kind of belief in the divine. In God, in a God or gods, in spirits or something supernatural. It's universal to human experience. And so Calvin asks, and we ask, why don't we accept a belief in the divine as inherently or properly basic to the human existence? For instance, in, in the same way that we believe in visual, auditory, and other senses. I don't have to prove evidentially that I can see things, that my eyes work, that I'm looking, you know, at the 15 people in this room, or that the chairs are blue, or that the fans are on. 
I, I don't have to give either a logical or an uh, experiential, evidential, excuse me, justification for that, ex, you know, for that perception. Why can I not believe that perception in God is equally and properly basic as my seeing and my hearing and my tasting and my touching? Okay? There is a school of thought in philosophy called Reformed Epistemology. One of the reasons it's called Reformed Epistemology, bless you, is because Alan Plantinga is one of the major movers in this, and he is a Reformed theologian as well as being a philosopher. The Presbyterian Church is a Reformed theological church, looking back to Calvin, which is one of the reasons he's quoted there. Reformed Epistemology proposes exactly that we don't have to prove it, that we can take as properly basic the perception we have of God, and that those who don't, on the contrary, have a natural tendency to believe in God, are broken. Rather than us having to prove ourselves, maybe the people who don't believe in God are the ones who have something wrong. We would define that as sin, as being the things that blinds them to God. But, you know, again, Plantinga and others make the argument that if I'm unable to see the way everyone else sees, then we have names for that. Blindness caused by cataracts or vitamin A deficiency or whatever. In other words, it's not everybody else's problem that they can see and I can't. It's, it's something wrong with me. Well, if the vast majority of the human race has had a perception of God and there are now some modern people who don't, why do they say we have a problem? Maybe our way is the natural way, and they have something wrong with them. Why do we have to prove it? Why can we not see, based upon the, you know, the history of human experience, that a perception of the divine is properly basic to the human being? Make sense? Yes. So while we do have good arguments, valid as much as any other kind of argument for the existence of God, such arguments are not necessary for a rational belief in God. I can argue from history that people have always believed in God. You know, you can say, well, they had different kinds of ideas of what God was. Okay, that's another issue. But the perception of the divine is an almost universal human trait. Okay? Let's take a break. So we talked about the arguments for God's existence. So, establishing that we believe that there is a God, what do we believe about God? In other words, what is God like? Now, I just gave you uh, the Caleb cosmological argument, which identified some necessary characteristics of a being that could create the universe. So that's one set of things we could come up with, or we could simply, uh, I'm gonna focus more on what the traditional understanding of God, a divine being, the greatest conceivable being would be, and talk about those. First, we perceive of God as being omnipotent. Now, most people make the mistake of or, or, all-powerful. Most people make the mistake of thinking that omnipotent or all-powerful means God can do anything. I hate to burst your bubble, but God cannot do anything. God cannot create a married bachelor. God cannot create a round square. God cannot lie because that is not his character. So we need to understand that God has the power of being omnipotent to do anything that is logically possible, which means anything that is not inherently contradictory. A square circle is not logically possible. Okay? Now, there are some people, your book talks about this, uh, William of Ockham, who came up with Ockham's razor as, as a, a, a principle. William of Ockham was one of the ones that argued that we don't have a right to do anything to limit God's possibilities, and that God could create a square circle. Okay, God can do whatever he wants. But all indication we have is that God has chosen to act logically. If God does not act logically, if God does things that are inherently contradictory, are we in trouble? <laughs> okay? Because we won't be able to count on anything. When I say that God cannot lie, if we cannot believe that God, being a good and benevolent God, if we do not believe that there are certain things that in His goodness and benevolence He cannot do, like lie or cheat or you know be vicious in a way that is gratuitous then we really are in trouble so we believe
God can do anything that is not logically impossible or inherently contradictory. Or, Charnock would say, or something that is against his nature. Well, I, that's what I was just talking about, that God can't lie, because that's exactly. inherently contradictory. Exactly. It is contrary to his nature. You know, that's what I mean by inherently contradictory to his nature. Um, uh, there's something else I was going to say about that. Oh, yeah. The old, the old question, you know, and it, kids especially, you know, like to play with this. If God can do anything, can God make a rock so big that God can't lift it? Have you ever heard that one? Well, the, the logically appropriate answer to that is, yes, God could make that rock, and then God could lift it. Okay? I mean, that's the only reasonable. Otherwise, it is illogical. You know? Now, so God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He can do all things that are not logically impossible. Secondly, we believe God is atemporal. Whenever you put an A in front of something, it means not. So he's not temporal. He is not limited by time. Just like atheist, an atheist is somebody who's not a theist. Okay. Um, amoral, not having morals. So this means God transcends time, that he is not limited by time. Since time is necessarily relative. Thank you, Albert Einstein. Okay, do you know what E equals MC squared means? <laughs> Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. The speed of light is actually a time factor in that. And so time is relative. I mean, a lot of Einstein's theory of relativity has to do with what happens when things go really, really fast. As we approach the speed of light, things get shorter. Time changes, right? The old, old idea, you've seen the science fiction movies, if somebody was shot into space in a rocket and they're traveling at close to the speed of light, when they come back to Earth, they would only have aged a year and everybody else would, you know, would be 97. The time varies. Time flexes based upon things like speed, that is velocity, mass, the weight of an object, space equals mc squared. That basically means if you took a sofa and you threw it at the speed of light squared, it would turn into pure energy. Time is one of the factors there. Okay? An absolute God, by definition, is not limited to any other relative limitations like mass, space, velocity. He is outside time as well. Okay? Now there are a couple of things that, that argue with, with this one way or the other. One of the beliefs is called sympaternalism. <laughs> Say that three times fast. Yeah. I don't expect you to... Uh, some of these terms I put in here because they're in the book, and I don't want you to think I'm just skipping over because I can't pronounce them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sympaternalism is the view that God has to be temporal, meaning inside time, in order to be personal. Because if he wasn't inside time, that he couldn't act in history, he couldn't answer our prayers, etc. Okay. Um, a variant view is omnitemporalism, which is the view that God is atemporal in that he's not limited by time, but instead is present at all times at once and so is able to act within time, which I think is the answer. The analogy that I used, I think yesterday, when we think about time as being like a, you know, like a toy train, we're on that train, and at any given moment, we're looking out the window, and we're experiencing bugs, <laughs> certain, certain things. In other words, we have one moment at a time. As the train moves along this track, which one end of it is at the start of the universe when God created time, and the other end of it is at eternity. So we're moving along that train, and we only experience one moment at a time. That's, that's how time happens for us. But God is the guy who made this train set, and he's standing above it, and he can reach out and touch this part of it, or this point in time, or this point in time, or this point in time, or this point in time. The fact that we see him as outside that stream of time, and yesterday I used the drawing, the diagram that Francis Schaeffer uses, which is a dash with a circle around it, the circle being God, the dash being time, and God is outside time, but can reach down at any point that he wants and touch any moment in time. That's what omni temporalism means. And that is the right explanation, I believe, for how it is, contrary to you know, the idea that God has to be in time, 
That's how God can be outside time, not affected by time, but still be able to touch and interact with time at any, at any point. Carol. Does that mean God can change the past? Yes, I believe it does. Now, some people would argue that. Some people would argue that God cannot change the past. C.S. Lewis says, and I'm going to mention this later, that um, one of the understandings of evil is that evil may be something that God will retroactively correct at the consummation. That, that the worst of suffering that his, his children and people have experienced, God will go backwards and make that glory for them. Okay? It's also true, I had the experience once, a friend of mine was taking uh, graduate exams. I was, I was graduating from college, she was in her senior year. And I, I promised to pray, and it was going to be in the morning. Well, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I was with a friend, and I went, oh, darn, I forgot to pray for Lynn's test. And my friend very wisely said, well, you still can. You can pray now for God to have blessed the taking of that test in the morning. I believe that's completely valid. You know, especially since I hadn't heard anything. I didn't know how she did, or if she made it, or you know, whatever. So I believe that God is outside time. He can affect all points in time, not just where we are, but all moments in time are real to God right now. Maybe right now is not the right expression. That each moment in time is God is real to God equally. From the beginning of time as He created, even before that for God, to the end of time as we understand it. John, first time? Time, time, time is an, a, an element of his creation. We just justify the argument that that God is uh, apart from his creation, but interacts with his creation. Right. Which is a fundamental Christian belief that's different than a lot of Asian religions, like pantheism, pantheism, etc., which is also the New Agey stuff. Forever? Well, um, isn't it possible that there's no past, present, or future with God, that it's all contained? I think, yeah, I, I, that's another way of saying what I was trying to say, and that is that all moments of time are present to God equally. You know, past, present, future, all of those are in effect now from God's perspective. Okay, they are all contained within Him because He is outside of it. That's omnitemporalism. That's another way to explain that. Yes? And is it possible that perhaps we have already, this is maybe stretching it a bit, but the fact that our life may have already started is present and has already ended? From God's perspective, that would be accurate. That would be true. And we're going to talk about free will in a minute. Well, we're going to need another couple hours. And, and doesn't that go really well with God's name of I am? I am. Yeah. Meaning, uh, you know, I, I am like who I am. I exist. Yeah. I am present whenever. Okay. All right. So let's continue. We believe that God is omniscient, which means all knowing. Now, this raises the question if God knows everything, meaning he knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, then do I really have free will? Because the very idea, if God knows it, knows exactly what I'm going to do, and he's known it forever, then didn't he sort of plan on that? There's a logical argument for that. And I'm going to give you four different responses to that question. The first one is the compatibilist view. And again, I'm taking this straight out of the book. I'm explaining to you the stuff in the book. The compatibilist view accepts that people um, have free will to do what they want, but they don't have free will to do otherwise. In other words, as far as I can tell, I'm making my own decisions. But those decisions are already in God's knowledge, and I don't have the option of making any decisions other than the decisions I'm going to make. This suggests that people can be free and morally responsible and yet still act in predetermined ways. The difference is my perspective, which is that I'm making my own choices, versus God's perspective, and that is that I'm doing exactly what he knew I was going to do. Yeah. Okay, got that? That's one view. The second view, which is called the open theist solution, is the belief that God knows what will happen in most ways, like in physical terms. The book uses the example, knows where the moon of Jupiter is going to be at a certain time or whatever. But he does not have foreknowledge of the future actions of free human beings. This is the only one of these arguments that, on prima facie, on the surface of it, does not seem consistent with Scripture, that God doesn't know something. But there's a version of this that I think is accurate, and I'm going to come back to that after I give you the others. Okay? Sort of the grossest view. <laughs> the third is the Occamist solution, which comes from William of Ockham, the guy who gave Occam's razor again. 
And that proposes that God knows what will happen in the future because that is what's going to happen in the future. Not because he said that, but, you know, and if, if I'm planning to go to Guadalajara tomorrow, but instead of decide to stay home and clean Carolyn's worm bins, <laughs> God can say, I knew you could do that, you know. That I have free choice, and God simply completely apart from it knows what's, what I'm going to choose. In other words, a person exercises free will. In every case, God simply knows that those free choices are going to be made. If a person makes different choices, God also would have known in advance that that new choice would have happened instead. Okay? John? Help me, help me understand the difference between the com Very close. Compatibilist and the, and the compatibilist view sees that things are set. And, and, and that I'm making my own choices, but those things are set and God knows them. The Occamist view says, things may not be set, I may make a different choice, but God knew I would have made that different choice. There's a flexibility that is, I mean, it's hard to understand, I'll grant you. There's a flexibility of choice that is allowable in the Occamist view that is not in the Compatibilist view. The Compatibilist view said, from my, says, from my perspective, I'm making my own choices. But God knew that in advance, you know, that's the only choice I really could make. I could not not make that choice. The Occamist view says I can make a different choice. But then God would have known I was going to do that anyway. Let's not go beyond the test. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Okay. The fourth one, which is really the hardest one to think, to conceive of, I think, is that God has something which um, Molinist, who is a Spanish theologian, philosopher, described as middle knowledge. That is that God has a knowledge of all the possible ultimate outcomes from all the possible free choices. And that God simply directs circumstances to prompt us in the direction that he wills. This has been challenged by some people because it's not really free will, they think. Which means, in the next half hour, there are 937 things Ross could be doing. And God knows, it's my choice, which of those 937 or a million, 246, I don't care. Which of those, I can choose any of those I want, I have free will. God knows in every variant of that what's, what the results will be. You know? So God is aware of every option. He has middle knowledge, which means he knows what the options are, and he knows what the consequence of each of those decisions, but he lets me choose among those options. Um, and when he has a certain desire, then he will sort of direct me to make a particular choice of the many free choices I can make. All right? Some of these aren't easy, but they're all efforts to try to explain how we can have free will. Now, let me tell you what the book identifies open theist, meaning God doesn't really know, as being the only one that really is not possible given Scripture. There are legitimate, even evangelical philosophers, Christian philosophers who believe various of these other three. I, on the other hand, <laughs> there are two passages of Scripture that lead me to believe that there may be a version of the open theist open theist solution that is viable. And that is the kenosis passage in Philippians, where it says that Jesus did not um, take his divinity, did not grasp his divinity and hold on to it, but rather set it aside in order to be like us. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus lost or misplaced or didn't have access to his divinity. He still walked on water and raised the dead and all that. But to be fully human, he was not, you know, he's, he, he took his divine powers and authority and sort of set it over here for our sake. Which means God can limit himself if he chooses. Not that he is limited, but he can himself choose to limit himself. Another example of that is in Genesis, the garden scene after Adam and Eve sin, Where it says, and God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he called out, where are you? And then when Adam and Eve sort of sneak out there covered with leaves, he says, who told you you were naked? Bless you. Um, now, there's a couple ways you can you do that. The one is that God is speaking you know, facetiously in order to get them to confess. That's a common. I don't read it that way. What I read is that God, out of love and respect for his creatures, chose not to use his omniscient glasses to know everything they were doing. He gave them their privacy. In other words, not because he had to or because he was limited, but because he chose not to spy on them in order that they truly would have freedom. 
and respect and the kind of relationship that God wanted to have with them. Now, I'm not actually pitching that. I, I, I tend to be, other than that, kind of a, an optimist kind of thing, that God knows, you know, we can choose whatever we want, God knows what those choices are going to be, and that's not doesn't mean he makes us do it. But I'm teased by the idea from those two passages of Scripture in Genesis and Philippians that maybe God willingly does not choose, or chooses not to is a better way to say it, to see everything, all the decisions we're going to make. Not because he can't, but because he chooses not to. So that doesn't in any way diminish God's power or authority. At any moment, he can decide to step back into the thing the way Jesus did when he was resurrected. Or when he, you know, when he raised Lazarus or walked on the water or fed the 5,000 or any of the other miracles he did. He can reclaim his divine authority and power and rights anytime he wants. So there's a teaser for you. Think about that. You see, you see where I'm coming from on that and how that is it's sort of a, a version of the open theist view that does not actually limit God because it is God who's choosing to do something. Marvin? Certainly after Adam and Eve, though after Cain's and Eve, but Abel, God said to him, where's your brother? Yeah, that I think was a facetious because I think, you know, he, he, he was calling him to confess in that case, yeah. I think. Well, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. Uh, I think you know the answer to that question. Yeah? Well, I've always questioned why God would be strolling in the garden and wonder where they are. Mm -hmm. When I was raised that he knows everything. So it was kind of funny to see these questions and it's kind of nice to hear some yeah. of the answers. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. I've only got a half an hour more. We've got, you know, the whole world to deal with. <laughs> Another idea about God, which is a traditional, has all you know, has until very recently been the traditional understanding of God, is impassibility. Impassibility says that God cannot be affected by outside forces, and particularly, God cannot have emotions, because what is an emotion other than something that's affecting me, you know, that's changing me in effect? Because impassibility is linked to immutability, the inability to be changed. Well, when I get mad, I'm not the same, exactly the same person I was before I got mad. When I fall in love, I'm a different person than before I fell in love. And yet, there are aspects of change that occur, and yet God has always been perceived as not being able to be affected by change. Remember the thing about he's outside, he's transcendent, he's outside time, he's, he's immutable, he's not material, because both of those things would imply that he's changeable. So. Let's talk about the various possibilities here. Impassibility is the belief that God cannot be affected by outside forces and so therefore cannot experience emotions as a necessary aspect of his perfection and immutability. How, how am I equally perfect, more perfect, or less perfect when I get mad? Less perfect. God can't be less perfect. He can't be more perfect because he's completely perfect now. No, you said, am I? I was talking about that. I was talking about me. Exactly. Yeah. Well, anybody. Uh, or Moses, when he was upset with the people, he said, you know, I'll kill them all and start a new. So it sounds like he's angry. Well, yeah. we're getting to, wait till we get to the possibility. Okay. Now, this is the traditional theological view. More recently, as the book points out, in modern times, there are more and more people who don't accept impassibility because there are scripture verses where God seems to change his mind, where he gets angry, where he, you know, he's jealous, you know, of their worship of other gods, etc. Okay? But let's recognize emotions imply change and God cannot change. So that's a problem. The view of passibility, which is the opposite, is the belief that God can experience genuine emotions, God can suffer. That God's heart is broken about things, and that that's a necessary aspect of his ability to personally relate to us. That emotion is as essential to divine personhood as it is to human personhood. I would not be a human being if I did not have feelings. Well, the people who believe in passibility of God believe God could not really be God if he didn't have feelings. If he didn't love, for instance. If he didn't, you know, if he didn't feel anger at the appropriate times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those who maintain passibility says that God can feel emotions. Well, then does that mean he can change? Because if he was not angry one minute and angry the next, that's some kind of change. So is God not immutable? 
Does that take us back and challenge some of the other beliefs we have about him? Don't we always think of God as being emotional? I mean, for instance, for instance, um, when he put Noah in the ark and he killed everybody else, he was angry that the people of the world were... Right, but the question is, how is that consistent with the nature of God as being completely transcendent and unchangeable and, you know, immutable, all of that? So that's the theological question and philosophical question. How can both of those things be true? That it seems to describe God at various times as expressing, as feeling and expressing emotion, and yet, by definition, that creates a problem with the other aspects of the nature of God. So, I think a good explanation, which the book presents, is what's called divine omnipathos, which means omnipathos, omni means all, right? Pathos means feeling or emotion. Okay. Um, that's the belief that God does experience emotion, but unlike people, God experiences all emotions at all times and for all eternity. So there's no sense in which God is either dominated by or changed by his experience of emotion, so he remains immutable. Back to sort of that example, you know, if we see, I gave you the train track of eternity. If you think of God as having within himself love all the time, and there's an aspect of God that, that has righteous anger against the things of God all the time, and he is jealous for the affection of the people all the time, it's not something that comes on him, it is something that is resident in his perfection constantly, for all time and all eternity. If we believe that, that God, in effect, is the, the embodiment of all the righteous emotions. When God is angry, it's not a bad thing. It's because it's justified. Then if God experiences or has contained in himself all of those emotions all the time, then emotion is not something that changes God. And so his immutability is not affected. Make sense? Yes. I think that's the best way of understanding how God can be angry, how you know God can be jealous for the worship of, of the Israelites, etc., etc., etc. That all of those things are in Him all the time. We just hear about some of them at particular times when it's most appropriate for them to be expressed, but it's not because it came on, came on it; it was there already. Fair? Yes. Okay. I want to now talk about the biggest single problem for belief in God, the biggest single argument that people make against the belief in God, and that is the problem of evil and suffering. Linda, you asked me about this in one of the past classes, you know, when I mentioned that this is the biggest argument, and you said, well, what do you say about that? I didn't get into that right then because I knew we were going to talk about it now. This is the argument. God is believed to be omniscient. He knows all things that are logically possible to know. God is omnipotent. He is able to do anything that is logically possible to do. Again, you can't make a married bachelor. It's not logically possible. God is omnibenevolent, which means he desires to do every good thing that can possibly be done. God is good. So, God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, God is good. Well, if God is omniscient, then he is fully aware of all the pain and suffering that exists in the world. If God is omnipotent, then he is able to prevent all pain and suffering. If God is omnibenevolent, he would want to prevent all pain and suffering. Yet pain and suffering continue. Therefore, the argument goes, God is either not all-knowing, or he is not all-powerful, or he is not all-good, or he doesn't exist at all. This is the argument against the existence of God because of the presence of evil. Now, I said evil and suffering because there's an aspect of suffering which is, which we would not necessarily call, I mean, we could say all suffering is evil, but it's not caused by evil. Natural disasters, for instance. You know, you can't say that something evil made that volcano erupt. Maybe we can. <laughs> but there's some sort of naturally a causing uh, things that occur to cause suffering, and there's some that's caused by human intent. Wars, oppression, murder, violence, okay, which plainly are evil. So evil and suffering, and sometimes we just talk about evil, but suffering is actually more what people are concerned about. Evil is that by itself, unless you think of, of concrete 
manifestations of evil, evil by itself is an abstract. Suffering is something we can conceive of as being a concrete, right? So, we will grant the first three, that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Where we want to take exception, you'll remember that philosophically, the way you counter any argument is you address problems with some of the premises, right? You say, this, I just gave you six premises. These are the first three. I don't have a problem with those. No Christian does. The ones we have a concern with are four, five, and six. That if God is omniscient, he's fully aware of the pain. If he's omnipotent, he's able to prevent the pain. If he's omnibenevolent, he would want to prevent the pain. Therefore, he must not be one of those things we said. Let's talk about those three. First, if, actually, I probably should say fourth, because this is the fourth premise in the argument. If God is omniscient, he is fully aware of all the pain and suffering that occurs. If God is omnipotent, he is able to prevent all the pain and suffering. Yes, those things are true as premises. But we need to recognize that God has shown his awareness and his compassion for human suffering. God has not been completely objective about this. He has shared in our humanity and suffering, most especially in the nature of Jesus. So when we, the arguments seem to be saying God knows everything, God's all powerful, <clears throat> but he doesn't seem to care. He has shown he does care. By coming into humanity, you know, when we do the words of institution for the sacraments, we say, you know, Jesus suffered in every way that we have, and yet was without sin. He suffered betrayal, he suffered hunger, he suffered, you know, tiredness, he was the pain of being beaten, the pain of uh, crucifixion. God himself has experienced all of that as a way of saying he is aware and he is concerned and cares about us. It's also true that God has chosen to limit suffering in very specific ways. The most obvious one is Job. In the book of Job, when the devil appears in the courts of heaven and says, um, and God says, what do you think about my, my servant Job? Isn't he great? He is so obedient. And Satan says, of course he's obedient. You know, I mean, he's worse than Barbie. He's got everything. <laughs> and God said, fine. Then you can, you can do some, whatever you want to him, but you can't kill him. And Job goes through all this suffering. But the point is that God had a limitation. And God addresses some of those things later on. There are other examples where God clearly has limited I mean, if God had not limited some of the suffering that's been in the world, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Right? And in lessening the suffering, he's not only done it, and, and I would argue that the, the discovery of major vaccines to cure diseases and things of that sort um, are an example of God's hand in working to help lessen suffering. I believe that's true. In addition to the practical limitation of suffering, sharing in the suffering, healing the suffering, God has given all who choose to believe in Him the Holy Spirit, who provides comfort and encouragement in the midst of our suffering. So the point in all of this, He knows and He's all and you know and He's able to do something about it. He has, while He hasn't removed all the suffering, He has actively been involved in the nature of human suffering. Christianity, by the way, is the only religion that really has can make those claims because the nature of what we believe from Scripture and from the and from Jesus. Yes. Does this discussion of suffering not go right back to the previous discussion about emotion? Um, because if we are made in God's image, then He too can suffer. Right. And he, you know, He, he did suffer on the cross, etc. But exactly. He suffers daily. Our suffering. When we talk about God being eternal, you know, that is a temporal, not a time, then in a very real way, in a very real way, the worst of the suffering that Jesus experienced, he experiences it every moment of eternity. Because he is present in every moment of eternity right now, from his perspective. And so his suffering wasn't just for six hours hanging on the cross. It was forever. Constant. And yet he did that for us. So that's one point is God has not been blind or unwilling to respond to human suffering. And again, only Christianity can make that claim. Other religions do not. 
Uh, Islam, for instance, has a, a, a doctrine of absolute fatalism. Anything that happens is God's will, no matter how horrible it is, you can't question it. Very practical consequences of that. When I was with World Vision and we had massive outbreaks of some diseases in West Africa, and we went into some of the countries of West Africa and wanted to do inoculations for measles and other things that were killing a lot of children, especially, some of the imams said, no, if they die from that disease, then that's God's will. You know, that's a lot. This fatalism that we can't do anything about it because God has willed it. That's not how God, the Christian God, works. Okay. A second point about that is that evil and suffering exist as a direct result of the misuse of human free will. Ultimately, we're the reason that things are broken so badly. And for God to remove all the suffering by fiat, which means by just saying so, by just you know, making it happen, would irrevocably compromise human will and freedom. And the consequences of that are beyond what we can imagine. God would, in effect, have to remove human free will in order to counter the consequences of human free will in such a radical way. Do you really want to have that taken away? I can't, we can't even conceive what that would mean. And yet it would be necessary for him to remove, if he were to remove all suffering, to also remove human free will, which is the source of most of that suffering. Okay. Now, the third premise, actually the sixth premise, which is the one I think is most liable to criticism from a Christian perspective, is the statement that if God is omnibenevolent, he will want to prevent all pain and suffering. Okay, there's several things wrong with this. Yes? Well, what define omnibenevolent? All good. If God is all good, if everything about God is good and loving and gracious, which we believe is true of God. Compatible to my feelings. Well, I mean, because as, I mean, it doesn't have to be your feelings. I mean, it, it, I think the the objective. we can argue about you know we can argue about what goodness and benevolence means. Yeah, you're yeah. talking benevolence, about objectively. But, objective. But benevolence may be correction. Hang on, we'll get there. Okay. More accurately, God's benevolence means He desires the greatest good which may not be the immediate relief of human suffering. Pain often directs people back to God. C.S. Lewis said that pain is the megaphone that God uses to get people's attention. People often grow best through suffering, and again, much of what it means to be freely human seems almost to require the existence of suffering. There's a connection here. We simply may not see far enough or clearly enough to understand how it is that suffering may lead to a higher good. We have an example of it. Can you think of one? Suffering leading to a higher good? Joseph. Jesus. Joseph. I mean, there are a lot of them. Joseph. Jesus. 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 Yeah. Suffering led to, you know, without suffering being real, we would be lost in our sin. And we would not have the great examples of those who, who went through so much. Even a not biblical example of people all over the world, well, all over the U.S., and you say no pain, no gain. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a suffering in a very mild oh, sense. Right. Like, you know, like weightlifting or something. The, the, uh, thinking hard, doing studying, all that stuff. You can't. Exactly. Yeah, you did that. There is a cost to things. Yeah. In fact, this, and I'm going to come to this a little bit further later on. Um, when we say we simply may not see far enough or clearly enough to understand, when a child is taken to the dentist, I almost said the child's taken to the vet. <laughs> the child is taken to the dentist. That child does not understand often why it's necessary to go through that painful thing, or gets a shot, or has to have surgery. And so, the assumption that physical suffering, that we understand all of that, and that it's it's completely unnecessary and a sign of a lack of Benevolence is it a lack of benevolence on the part of a parent when they take a child to get a, mm -hmm. a necessary life-saving surgery? Mm -hmm. Obviously, suffering sometimes, whether whether the person experiencing it or not understands it, may be for ne a necessary reason. All right, related to that, this statement: if God is omnibenevolent, He would want to prevent all pain and suffering, makes the assumption that physical suffering is the greatest evil. And that stopping it is the greatest good. This relates to the idea that some suffering may be necessary for a greater good. Whether we can understand that or not, 
Now, both of those assumptions, that physical suffering is the greatest evil and stopping physical suffering is the greatest good, may be, and quite often are, flawed. They're simply not true. The greatest evil, from a Christian perspective, is our, the human rejection of God and His love, and the greatest good is our returning to Him, to love and serve Him, and sometimes we have to hurt before we are alerted to that reality. C.S. Lewis's megaphone of pain. So, there's two reasons, or actually more than that, I brought several things in there, why the, the premise of God being omnibenevolent would mean He wants to stop all suffering and pain. And finally, we need to recognize our human lives and whatever we experience in it, including suffering, are only a breath in God's eternity. Just a mist. You know, I was just, just reading that in Ecclesiastes. You know, you're just a mist. You're here for a moment and then gone. And God will eventually make all things right in a heaven that is free from suffering. Again, this is nothing. This is, you know, this is a headache that you have for an hour and then get over it in terms of you know, human suffering in this life compared to eternity. And our belief is that God will make all things right. He will wipe every tear from the eye in Revelations. He will, you know, there will be no more suffering or pain or grieving or death. And He will be our God and we will be His people. And this is just, you know, the line we're waiting in before we get into the act. And it's not a very long line by comparison of eternity. And it's perhaps, as I said earlier, as C.S. Lewis suggested, that God will, at the point of the final consummation, at the end of time, that God will work retroactively to turn all past suffering, at least for those who served Him, into glory. Because He can control time. I think all of these are arguments, not proofs, but legitimate challenges to the idea that if God is omnibenevolent, which we accept He is, that He would want to end all physical pain and suffering. Not necessarily so. And so therefore, we do not believe that evil, the argument from evil, is in any way sufficient to say God can't exist. Are we right there with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ross, uh, would you agree that maybe the problem that we face now is we, society in the Western culture has redefined benevolence in that only what satisfies my desire right now. Um, this, this is really good. Uh, but we, we look at benevolence as the absence of all pain and all suffering right here and now. And, and so, you know, when, when I look at this, I'm thinking, um, you know, had, had, had Jesus not suffered, had Adam not sinned, which was the introduction, introduction of death, and all this stuff. Right. We would have never known His mercy. We would right. have never known His love. I agree. Mercy. And what we're trying to say here when we say the assumption that physical suffering is the greatest evil, another way to say that is that we have only a very short-term view. Yeah. And there is a long-term well, view. Benevolence means He desires the greatest good. That's, that's a good point. Exactly. But our Western culture does not accept that. Well, they might accept that he, that he wants the greatest good, but they define the greatest good as different than us. The greatest good is what I want. Right now. Right now. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, I was going to mention that we, without God, become so grounded in these earth suits mm -hmm. that uh, we believe that everything good, if He is a good God, that He wouldn't let anything happen to us right. in these, right. in this ground. Because it's about me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what feels good to me, what about the one true God creator of the universe who is all eternal, who has a right to do whatever He wishes? Even if, even if it involves me having to suffer for a while, for reasons I may not understand. Marvin? And then i got to get going. i got to finish this up. And, and God knows all, but we don't. And He knows who's going to turn to love and serve Him, but we don't. This is a test of time where we see, even for ourselves, on a day-to-day -day basis, how we evolve. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to make the separation at the end of time, and, yeah. and then He can have forever. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So, we have argued for the belief uh, the rational belief in God. So, we've accepted theism, that God exists. So, do we believe that Christianity is in any way exclusively true? Meaning it is true and others are not. Accepting the theistic belief in God, what version of belief in God 
What specific kind of God is it that we believe is correct? Start out with the premise, and some of this stuff is from me, okay, not from the book. The law of non-contradiction demands that not every religion can be correct. You remember the law of non-contradiction. The law of identity, A equals A, something is what it is. The law of the excluded middle, something is either A or B. It's, not in, it's either true or false, there's not an in-between between true and false. I mean, something can be partially true, but that's not the same as saying it's in-between true and false. You're splitting it up then. The third, and in this case most critical, is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot both be and not be. Something cannot be both true and not true. If I say Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, and a Muslim, or a Hindu, or somebody else says he wasn't, we can't both be right. Now don't misunderstand me. We both have a right to believe what we believe. And I would defend that right. We live in a pluralistic society. But, but having the right to believe something doesn't mean that what you believe is right. And yet, we have gotten so mush-minded in our modern culture that we think, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it with your whole heart. Well, Jesus may be the Son of God to you, but he's not to me. That is contrary to the basic laws of rationality and thought. It can't be true. Okay, so let's talk about some of the arguments for religious pluralism, which means multiple religions all being valid. One of the arguments is the argument from religious diversity, which says that the very existence of multiple religions strongly suggests or insists that no one religion is exclusively true. And sometimes they add to that because God wouldn't allow that to happen. He wouldn't allow people to believe things that are incorrect or false. Three points contra. Contra means against. Three points contra to that. The law of non-contradiction demands that, that when religions are plainly contradictory, they cannot all be right no matter how many people believe it. That's the, you remember the logical fallacy you know, of, um, of majority, you know, the fallacy of majority, that a lot of people believe it, so it must be true? That's a fallacy. Logically, that doesn't hold. A second argument against this, there are other beliefs that are held by many people. Believe in ghosts, believe in alien visitations, and being probed, conspiracy theories, but just because pe people, even a lot of people, believe in those things does not, therefore, demand that they be true. A lot of people believe a lot of really dumb things. The number of people who believe something doesn't logically make it true. That's basically the argument of fallacy of the jury, right? You know people who think dumb things. <laughs> Third argument. <laughs> There may be a spiritual force in the world that is committed to misleading people. There is. In fact, there is. Yes. By our beliefs. Yes. So you can say, well, God wouldn't allow that. Maybe God's not the one that did it. Maybe the enemy of God is trying to confuse everybody, and that's why there are a lot of different beliefs. So the very idea of religious diversity does not hold as an argument for many religions being true. So what you're saying is Christianity. Christianity is the only truth. That's where we're going with this. Yes. Okay. I mean, we're 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 you're jumping ahead because we're making these arguments against some of the things that people say. These are what people are saying that well, all religions are equally right. Another argument for religious pluralism is the argument from unity of teaching. People who say that all religions are basically the same, they only differ in superficial ways, which is really stupid. It shows a complete lack of understanding of what world religions actually believe. I lecture on world religions, and trust me, they don't believe the same things. Yes, they may all, to some extent or another, advocate peace and goodness, and not all of them, and generosity, you know, the, the moral virtues. But some don't believe in the existence of God at all. Buddhism does not have a belief in God. Some of them don't believe in a personal God that we can relate to. Hinduism believes in many gods, but none of them that we can relate to in that way. Just to give some examples, there are others. Some have no belief in an afterlife or salvation. Some propose multiple gods that exist, like Hinduism, uh, versus there being one God. Some propose that salvation is entirely a result of how good you act, your good works. How can we say that all those religions believe the same thing? These are fundamental principles of difference between religions. G.K. Chesterton, one of my 
my primary heroes, observed that when people say all faiths believe the same thing, but they just practice their religions in different ways, that's exactly the opposite of the truth. He observes that every religion basically has priests or ministers or rabbis or shamans who perform rituals or liturgies or rites or whatever you want to call them. They do their religion in basically the same way, but what they believe behind that is fundamentally different. People have it exactly backwards when they say all religions believe the same thing, they just practice them differently. They don't believe the same thing and they do practice them the same. Basically. Okay. Has anybody got heartburn if I go over about 10 minutes or so? Are you okay with that? If you need to leave, you can go. I don't want to stop right now because I'm too close to, to having my head explode. <laughs> Another argument for pluralism is the argument from divine transcendence. This claims that we are ignorant about God because God is infinite, we are not. And so therefore, we, we can't say we're right and the people are wrong because we don't really know anything. Against this, while it's true that we are limited and God is not, and that should call us to be humble and compassionate, we also have to acknowledge that Christianity, at least, is a revealed religion. It didn't come out of us. It was given to us. And so our ability to perceive God is not something that has to be generated from my own intellect, but rather was communicated to me in a way that God condescended. He leaned down in order to communicate the truth about himself to us. So what we know about God is not dependent upon our abilities, but rather upon God's grace in revealing himself to us. So we can't say that we're too stupid to know anything about God. God spoke to us in simplistic terms, so we would know about him. The next argument is the argument from relativity of truth and logic, which is similar to the last one. This argues that an appeal to logic or reason, like the law of non-contradiction, in order to make absolute truth claims regarding exclusivity and religious belief is wrong, and that you can't argue logically about religion, you can only experience it. Can you say New Age? Against this, why must we abandon reason and logic when speaking of God when we're unwilling to do that in any other consideration? Being irrational is not considered an advantage in any other conversation. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Secondly, in saying we cannot, have, cannot make any absolute truth claims about religion, the relativists, the people who are saying this, are making an absolute truth claim, and so this is self-defeating. Right? They're arguing against themselves there. They can't say what they're saying if what they're saying is true. That's self-defeating. Whoops, wrong one. The next argument is from relativity of religious perception. The suggestion is that we cannot be so sure of our own religious beliefs as we, are all, as we all experience them through our own filters of perception, and so can't be sure of absolute truth. Remember the thing about, you know, it's not like we're looking through a pane of glass in order to see reality. Light is bouncing off of things, going through our, our uh, corneas and irises, striking the, you know, so everything gets filtered by our own perceptions. And if that's true, then maybe, we can't trust our perceptions. And so how do we know that what we believe about the nature of God is true? Well, rather than arguing against religious exclusivism, that is that one religion is more correct than others, this argument actually suggests there's no such thing as a legitimate religion, religious belief of any kind. Because that would apply to everybody, no matter whether you believe in Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or anything else. If you're discounting all of that, that's fine, but if any religious belief is possible, then it's still possible that one of them can be more right than the others. So this is not an argument against exclusivity, right? And, next, this argument actually counters the earlier argument, which is the argument from religious pluralism, by suggesting that the existence of so many different belief systems might just be a product of individualized perceptions, rather than to argue against one system being correct when others are mistaken. You know, if this is true, then no religious belief makes any sense. But that also explains why we got a bazillion different religions. Neither one of those things is valid. Okay. We believe that there is reason to accept one religion can be more correct than others. 
There's no logical, philosophical reason to argue that all religions are the same. In fact, it's kind of dumb. They're not the same. And they can't all be right. Fair? So, why do we believe what we believe? We get into the issue of the problem of miracles. I'm going to do this in a couple minutes. As we have argued, it is legitimate to hold that one religious belief can be more true than others. So why do we think Christianity is that true belief? Well, first, because of the historical witness. Christianity is quite unique. Islam, to some extent. Judaism, to a significant extent. It is a historical religion. It is based upon events that are attested to in history. Nobody ever really saw the god Ganesh, who, if you don't, the Hindu god Ganesh, who if you don't know is an elephant, who was born of a, of a human. Nobody saw that really happen. Nobody claims to have seen that really happen. Christianity, even more so than Islam, is a historical religion because it is based upon a primary historical event, which is the incarnate birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Nobody makes that claim about Muhammad or Buddha or Moses or anybody else. Okay. There is one event that is the linchpin, and it is a historical event for all of the Christian faith. And this is a miracle, definition of a miracle. This is not the definition of a miracle in the book, which I don't care for, just like I didn't care for the definition of a miracle in Gruden's book in Systematic Theology. This is my definition. <laughs> An event or occurrence in which God acts or allows his servants to act with intentionality in a way not limited by the usual boundaries of natural law which he has, been put, he has put in place. The point of that is people for 2,000 years have been claiming that they witnessed miracles in the Christian context, most especially those who attested to the miracle of the resurrection and ascension. And that miracle was such that people died rather than deny it. Very powerful. We also believe in Christianity because of the scriptural witness, the power and truth that has been reflected in scripture. There is no other book quite like it. I don't care what anybody else says. I have read the Quran. The Old Testament is part of our book. You know, I've read bits and pieces of the Upanishads and various other kinds of things. Nothing rings true the way our Bible does, nor has had quite the power and influence as that. Mm -hmm. The effect of the church throughout history. The church of Jesus Christ invented orphanages and hospitals, invented public schools. It's not to say that there wasn't medical care or schools before, but the idea that anybody who needed to can benefit from those things is a Christian invention. The church did that. The effect of the church militant down through history. The re record of personal experience and changed lives over the past 2,000 years. Again, the number of people who... who were touched by God to believe in Jesus Christ and gave their lives rather than deny that. That's not a rare occurrence in the history of Christianity. And then, against the one argument people make against believing in God, the argument from evil, there is a unique ability of Christianity to respond to the problem of evil. That God has limited it, he has expressed his concern, he shared it in the person of Jesus, he has promised a point at which he will no longer be present, he comforts us in the middle of, midst of it through the Holy Spirit, in addition to it. And God has proven that he is good and that there are reasons behind his actions. There is no other religious system that has a real answer to the existence of evil except us. Most of them, the fatalism of Islam and some others, just say, you know, tough it out. God is God and he'll do whatever he wants. If you don't like it, okay? Okay. Any questions about any of that? <clears throat> the change lives part, each of us individually can attest to that, that it makes a difference. Marvin? Well, just one point, sometimes we say, well, there's, there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things in a lot of these religions, and therefore they must be good. And, and that would be if, if the highest uh, value was easing suffering, but it would be a, 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 before it said is to turn your life to God. That's God's highest value. Right. Well, the Judeo-Christian belief would say the reason people are prompted to do good is because they are made in the image of God. And even if they haven't recognized that and chose to enter back into a relationship with God, there is still an aspect of God's image in them, this flicker that tells them that there is good that needs to be done. 
against evil, and so they do it. And so anytime people do that, that is an expression of them being made in the image of God, very consistent with Judeo-Christian ethic. That doesn't make it the highest good, but it is still good, because God is a good God, and they're in His image. And the definition is to say, well, these people must also be saved because they're still good. Yeah. Such good things. So what constitutes salvation? Yeah. I hope this has helped. Does this help you understand this stuff? Yes. Very good. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good.